ನಮ್ಮ ದೇಸನ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಸೋ ಮಚ್ ಫಾರ್ ಯುನೋ ಯುನೋ ಎಕ್ಸೆಪ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ಇನ್ವಿಟೇಶನ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ಸೋ ಮಚ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಯುನೋ ಬೋಧಿ ಮಿತ್ರ ಬಂತೆ ಐಸ್ ಬಿನ್ ಟೆಲಿಂಗ್ ಆಸ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಯು ಸೊ ಐ ವಾಂಟ್ ಹಿಮ್ ಟು ಟಾಕ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಯು ಆರ್ ಟೆಲ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ವಾಟ್ ಯು ಹ್ಯಾವ್ ಬಿನ್ ಡೂಯಿಂಗ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಇಂಟ್ರೊಡ್ಯೂಸ್ ಯು ಟು ಆಲ್ ಆರ್ ಸ್ಟೂಡೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಬೋಧಿ ಬಂತೆ ಇಸ್ ಮೈ ಫ್ರೆಂಡ್ and we are, we was in the same monastery uh, yeah. i think from 8th standard to 12th standard and yeah. and he went to that sri lanka then after the thailand mm. and i also follow them dhyana bodhi bantenchi olak karun detana bodhi mitra bantenni aplyala je sangitlo ani tanni je specially apl आपल्याला जे सांगण्याचा प्रयत्न केला ते म्हणजे की बुद्धिस्ट फॅमिली म्हणजे आज आपल्या महाराष्ट्रामध्ये आपण जेव्हा आपण म्हणतो की धम्म एस्टॅब्लिश करायचा आहे तेव्हा आपल्याकडे असे किती फॅमिलीज आहेत ज्याचे चार मुलं असताना तीन मुलं त्यांनी धम्माला दान दिलेले आहेत तर हे एक चांगलं उदाहरण आहे असं ते सांगतात की हे सगळ्यात म्हणते जे आपल्याला आज धम्म देसण देणार आहेत ते सगळ्यात फॅमिलीमधले सगळ्यात मोठे आहेत आणि त्यांचे चार भावंडामध्ये तिन्ही भावांना दान दिलेला आहे संघाला म्हणजे आणि तिन्ही पी एच डी करतायत म्हणजे पी एच डी करणार आणि शिकवतायत आणि शिकतायत आणि आई वडिलांनी तीन मुलं संघाला दिलेली आहेत आणि म्हणजे संघाला देऊन काय फायदा आहे मुलांचं काय फ्युचर आहे असं आपण जेव्हा विचार करतो की काय करायचं लाईफ वेस्ट आहे तर तसं काही नाही आहे आणि ही जी परंपरा आहे म्हणजे धम्म जर आपल्याला पुढे न्यायचं असेल तर फॅमिली मेंबर्सनी किंवा आपल्या प्रत्येक घराने आपले मुलं कसे संघाला द्यायचे किंवा त्याच्यात संघ संघ वाढवण्यासाठी उपासकांचा काय रोल असतो हे त्यांनी सांगितलं आहे आणि मला असं वाटतं की बनतेना तेच सांगायचं आहे आपल्याला की आपण जेव्हा महाराष्ट्रामध्ये संघ नाही तेव्हा आई वडिलांना प्रत्येक मुलाला काय म्हणायचं डॉक्टर करायचं असतं इंजिनियर करायचं असतं पण त्यांच्या डोक्यात असं कधी येत नाही की आपल्या मुलाला यु नो निबाणाला जाण्यासाठी हा घरदार सोडून भिक्कू बनवून त्याला त्याचं कायम दुःखातनं याला मुक्त करायचा मार्ग आपण दाखवला पाहिजे असं आपल्या आई कुठल्याच आई वडिलांच्या डोक्यात येत नाही किंवा तसं काही विचार पण करत नाही आपण किंवा आपल्याला असं वाटतं किंवा महाराष्ट्रातल्या पेरेंट्सला असं वाटतं की हे वेस्ट आहे लाईफ आणि काही गरज नाही ह्याची पण ज्यांनी धम्म सांभाळला इथेपर्यंत आलाय ते तसेच आई वडील आहेत आणि सगळ्यात जास्त पुण्य मला असं वाटतं त्याच आई वडिलांना मिळतं ज्याची जे आपल्या मुलांना धम्मासाठी दान करतात सो वी आर व्हेरी ग्रेटफुल टू युअर पेरेंट्स ऑल्सो म्हणते अँड यु नो दॅट्स वॉट आय वॉज ट्राईंग टू टेल एव्हरीबडी इन मराठी बोधी मित्र म्हणते वी वुड रिक्वेस्ट म्हणते टू टू गिव द धम्म ओके ओके थँक्यू व्हेरी मच थँक्यू मॅडम डॉक्टर योजना भागात अँड ऑल्सो to bante bodhimitra for saying so much actually <laughs> it was uh, not necessary i think uh, we we were just um, uh, following the teachings of the buddha we have been introduced to the teachings of the buddha quite early age so uh, that is how we got into buddha's teaching and that is how we started to follow the path but before starting my talk i want to begin with um, paying our sincere respect to the triple gems first so i think uh, you all can join with me namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa ಎತಿಸೋ ಭಗವ ಅರ್ಹಂ ಸಮ್ಮ ಸಂಬುದ್ಧೋ ವಿಚಾಚರಣ ಸಂಪನ್ನು ಸುಗಥೋ ಲೋಕವಿದೋ ಅನುತ್ತರೋ ಪುರಿ ಸದಮ್ಮ ಸಾರಥಿ ಸತ್ತೇವ ಮನುಷ್ಯಾನ್ ಬುದ್ಧೋ ಭಗವತಿ ವಾಥಾತೋ ಭಗವತ ಧಮ್ಮೋ ಸಂದಿಟ್ಟಿಕೋ ಅಕಾಲಿಕೋ ಏಹಿ ಪಸ್ಸಿಕೋ ಓಪನೈಕೋ ಪಚ್ಚತ್ತಂ ವೇದಿ ತಬ್ಬೋ ವಿನ್ಯೂಹೀತಿ ಸುಪಟಿಪನ್ನೋ ಭಗವತೋ ಸಾವಕ ಸಂಘೋ ಉಜುಪಟಿಪನ್ನೋ ಭಗವತೋ ಸಾವಕ ಸಂಘೋ ನ್ಯಾಯಪಟಿಪನ್ನೋ ಭಗವತೋ ಸಾವಕ ಸಂಘೋ ಸಾಮೀಚಿಪಟಿಪನ್ನೋ ಭಗವತೋ ಸಾವಕ ಸಂಘೋ 
यदिदम चत्तारी पुरुष योगानी अट्ट पुरुष पुग्गला ऐसा भगवतो सावक संगो आहु नहियो पाहु नहियो दक्षि नहियो अंजलि करनियो अनुतरं पुण्यक्षेत्रं लोकसाति ओके सो वेरी गुड इवनिंग टू एवरीवन एंड वांस अगेन थैंक यू मैडम डॉक्टर योजना बागा एंड आल्सो बांते बोधि मित्रा फॉर inviting me and giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts on some teachings of the buddha today i sincerely appreciate your efforts in bringing people together in a single virtual platform to hear and discuss the dhamma the buddha had always encouraged his followers to hear the dhamma and to engage in dhamma discussion for example in the mangala sutta we find that the buddha saying kalena dhamma savanam and kalena dhamma sakaccha etang mangala muttama discussing the dhamma in suitable time hearing the dhamma in suitable time is considered to be blessing and especially in this difficult time of covid-19 pandemic i think it is even more important to realize our human potentiality and the purpose of our existence and then make good use of our this human existence i should make it clear uh, at the very beginning that this is not so much as uh, preaching but sharing my little knowledge that i have acquired you know i have gained uh, in my spiritual journey as a monk so i have chosen to talk about the precious human life this evening because if we do not know how to appreciate and live this human life we cannot really proceed on to practice the dhamma with the time that we have on this earth as a human being so in this regard we see the buddha had appreciated this human life and he preferred it to the life of a deva or a brahma or beings in any other realms but the question is why the buddha gave so much more importance to the human birth comparing to the other forms of life the life of a deva or the life of a brahma it should be carefully thought about sometimes with the common people think that uh, it is because human beings are developed in various fields of knowledge arts science technology and so on but actually it is not what the buddha said one may become very rich or knowledgeable in various ways but this does not help him or her get rid of problems like birth old age sickness death the reason why the buddha says this um, human birth is precious is because it is as a human being that we can understand and differentiate between good and what is bad between what is happiness and what is suffering what is kusala and what is akusala so by understanding this we can make an effort to avoid suffering and get happiness and we can get happiness through the practice of the dhamma it was in fact with this thought of overcoming the samsaric suffering of birth aging sickness and death that the bodhisattva siddhartha renounced his princely life he was a prince he could easily become a king but in instead of instead of being a king he wanted to go to deep jungle and forest to find out the truth about our existence if you have read the buddha charita of acharya aswagosha especially you would see how determined siddhartha was to meet the right teacher to practice the right path and to attain the most precious samma sambodhi so that he could end the samsaric suffering or the existential suffering himself 
and teach others the same path. As you can see in the Buddha Charita, after visiting the city and seeing the four sites, namely an aged man, a sick person, a dead person, and an ascetic, Siddhartha returned to his palace. The courtesans and dancing girls were busy trying to seduce him. Siddhartha thought to himself, when aging, sickness, and death are constantly chasing us, how can we be so immersed in sensual pleasure, forgetting the reality of existence? He said, I am deeply troubled by the fact that we have limited time. I am timid, much perturbed, as I think of the old age, sickness, and death. I find no peace or content, much less joy, seeing the world with fire as if ablaze. This is from chapter 4 of uh, uh, Buddha Gosa's uh, Buddhicha, uh, Charya Avatara. So he decided to renounce his princely life. Ashoka in the Buddha Charita uh, beautifully explains how after Siddhartha left the palace in search of truth and a path leading to end the samsaric suffering, King Suddhodana and his uh, ministers tried everything to bring Siddhartha back to Kapilavattu. King Suddhodana even promised to give him the throne early so that Siddhartha returns to Kapilavattu. But he knew that the kingship would not give him freedom from samsaric bondage. In fact, he told to the compos to inform the king and everyone in Kapilavattu that either he would return only after realizing the truth or he would die in his effort of finding out the truth. Such was his determination. And when on his way he moved to Magadan kingdom, the newly appointed king, Bimbisara, came to know about it and immediately went to meet him. King Bimbisara had a good relationship with the Sakyan kingdom. Initially, he thought that Prince Siddhartha left his kingdom probably because he did not want to be so easily offered the kingdom, but he probably wanted to capture other kingdom with his army. So King Bimbisara himself wanted to offer Siddhartha half of his kingdom and rule the entire Magadan kingdom together. But Siddhartha refused the offer. Siddhartha said, conquering many kingdoms, being fortunate in pleasures and so on, should be actually viewed as misfortune for him. Because attainment of pleasure leads to pride. And pride makes them do what is wrong and not what is right. And when they are struck down by that, they come to an unhappy end. And if being a ruler of a kingdom is for one's satisfaction, Siddhartha said, I am happy and satisfied without a kingdom. And as you all know, after that, he spent as long as six years traveling in the deep jungles, meeting different teachers and learning different practices from them until he found the right way to attain enlightenment. So this account of Buddha's life clearly shows, firstly, that we need to have a right view or a proper perspective about our existence. Who are we? What is the purpose of our life? Are we really making use of our life to that direction? And secondly, how much determination we need to have to progress in the path and how much effort we need to put in achieving the goal. 
Let me now directly go into the discussion of why human life is considered as precious in Buddhist literature. As Buddhist texts tell us, once the king of the dragon world, Nagaloka, called Erakapatra, Erakapatra, he approached the Buddha. He was waiting for a long, long time to meet the Buddha, to get the Dhamma from him. When the Buddha was asked to explain the Dhamma, Buddha said, Kicho manusa patilabo, kichang machana jivitam, kichang saddhamma savanam, kicho buddhanam upadoti. That was the verse spoken by the Buddha to the Nagaraja Irakapatra. It means, heart is it to be born a human. Heart is the life of mortals. Heart is it to gain the opportunity of hearing the sublime truth, that is the Dhamma. And heart to encounter is the arising of the Buddhas. These are the four points that he spoke to the Nagaraja as being the most precious thing in a life. According to the tale, this Nagaraja was a human being in its previous birth previous life. But he lost the opportunity of using that life correctly. But Nagaraja was very intelligent. He knew that he was suffering for a long, long time and he was waiting for the Buddha to emerge on earth. When the Buddha appeared, he explained to the Nagaraja that he had lost a precious human life. Then when the Buddha preached the Dhamma to the Nagaraja, Nagaraja would not be able to practice it as he was not a human being. So the Buddha appreciated this human life and preferred it to the other forms of life, such as a Deva or a Brahma. The Buddha said, if you are born in heaven or hell or in any realms other than this human world, you cannot practice the Dhamma. In heavenly realms, the beings are too busy enjoying themselves, spending the merits they have accumulated in their previous lives. They do not have time left to think about or practice the Dhamma. In the hell realm, they have to undergo so much suffering that they do not have even a single moment to recall the name of the Buddha. So the Buddha said this human life is so rare that it cannot be explained in words. Even if it is explained, the common people for the lack of intelligence will not understand it. This human life is unquestionably a rare one. We can understand its importance from the explanation given by the Buddha to a group of, of newly ordained monks. The Buddha asked them, what do you think monks? If there is a yoke with a single hole in it, and there is a turtle with one eye living in the ocean, and that turtle comes up on the surface of the ocean once in a hundred years, is it possible for that turtle to see the sun through the tiny hole of the yoke that was floating around in the ocean? The monks replied, Bhante, this is impossible. This is not possible because the turtle does not know where the yoke is and there are enormous waves in the ocean. Then the Buddha said to the monks, no monks, even this is possible. But if you lose this precious human life, it is not easy to get it back again. So imagine how rare this human life is. And this is spoken by the Buddha himself. To be considered a human life precious, it should be it is that I mentioned in the text that if one considers his life as a human being to be precious, it should be free from these eight disabilities. The first one is being born in the world of hell being or even experiencing hell-like situations. The second is being born in the animal world 
or experiencing the life of an animal. Third is being born in the world of hungry ghost. In other words, experiencing the life of a hungry ghost. Fourth is being born in the formless realm and the realm of mindless being. That is to be born in Rupa Loka and Arupa Loka. Fifth is being born in a state or a country where there is no chance to hear the true Dhamma of the Buddha. Sixth is having defects in the five aggregates. Five aggregates, namely Rupa, Vedana, Sanya, Sankara, and Vijnana. Seventh is having wrong views, Michaditi. And the eighth one is being born at a time when there is no Buddha in the world or no Buddha Sasana in the world. So now if we check our life against these eight disabilities, we find ourselves in an agreeable and beautiful condition where we are able to access the Dhamma, the teaching of the Buddha. We are able to practice the teaching. We have enough resources we have Dhamma friends or Kalyana Mittas. We have our families supporting us to practice the Dhamma that serve as supportive condition for carrying out our practice. But the question is, are we taking the advantage of putting an effort in our practice? Or we are too lazy and reluctant in our effort? If so, we are missing out the opportunity. It is us who have to be ready for the, for the practice. It is us who have to make effort. It is us who have to Buddhas and enlightened beings will show us the path. Because like other religious traditions in Buddhism, the Buddha does not function as a savior. He acts as a guide, as a shower of the path. For example, we find the Buddha saying that You will have to make effort to progress in, in the path. I am just the shower of the path. It is the Dhamma and Vinaya that he left after his passing away. To be the guide for our life and practice. We understand what kind of Dhamma and Vinaya he was referring to. Why did he say the eight conditions of bondage for developing the full human potentiality? Because, for example, the hell world is full of suffering. In the animal world, too, there is so much pain and suffering. Among the animals, the stronger one is trying to kill the weak ones and so on. In the world of hungry ghosts, Petaloka, the beings are said to have a huge stomach and a tiny throat. They cannot eat even a single grain of rice. In the formless realm or aroma, Arupa Loka, you have consciousness, but no matter in a sense, or the matter is too subtle to be perceived. Thus, in the formless realm, we do not have the body for practicing the Dhamma. In the realm of mindless beings, they have form, but their consciousness is too fine for the practice of the Dhamma. Now, if you are born in a state or a country where there is no chance to hear the Dhamma, you cannot really practice the Dhamma. There are many people who do not know what is good and what is bad. They just do whatever they feel like doing. They think that is their life. That is how they should live their life. If you have any defect in the five aggregates, if the hearing sense is defective, for example, one cannot hear the Dhamma and therefore is disadvantaged in receiving, learning or practicing the Dhamma. If we carefully consider these eight disabilities, all of us or most of us here, I think, are free from six or seven out of eight is a
capabilities. However, there is one factor that is most of us are not free from, and that is the wrong view. Michaditi. We may become Buddhist and probably practicing Buddhism for a long period of time, but still we cannot we can have some sort of wrong views. It is not that we can properly understand or comprehend the teachings of the Buddha. What kind of wrong views might we have? The Buddha said, if you are a Buddhist or if you practice Buddhism for a long time, it does not mean that you will certainly attain Nibbana. Then how can one find out the true teaching? The Buddha mentioned in many places in the Tipitaka, we can particularly refer to this Kalama Sutta and there are some other similar suttas as well. When the Kalamas got confused about different types of teachings that were being taught in their place by different sages, when the Buddha went to this Kesa Sutta city, uh, Kalamas approached the Buddha. They expressed their confusion about different forms of teachings. And the Buddha said, you have a reason to get confused, but then he provided a guideline. He said, Yatta tumhe kalama ma anusasavena, do not go by oral tradition, ma paramparaya, do not go by lineage of teaching, ma iti kiraya, do not go by hearsay, ma pitaka sampadanena, do not go by a collection of scriptures, ma takkahetu, do not go by logical reasoning, ma nayahetu, do not go by inferential reasoning, ma akara parivitakkena, do not go by reasoned cogitation, ma ditti nijjana kantiya, do not go by the acceptance of a view by pondering it, ma bhabbarupataya, do not go by seeming competence of a speaker, ma samanono karoti, or just because you think the ascetic is your teacher. Then how one should know about the truth? Then the Buddha said, Yada tumhe kalama attanava jane yata ime dhamma kusala ime dhamma savajja ime dhamma vinyo garahita ime dhamma samatta samadhinna ahitaya dukkaya sangvattanteti ata tumhe kalama pajahe yata. When you know for yourself, that these things are unwholesome, these things are censured by the wise, blameworthy, they are not bringing any good for ourselves, not bringing any good for the society, then you should avoid being engaged in those views and those activities. On the contrary, the Buddha said, when you know for yourself that imedamma kusala, these things are wholesome, imedamma anavajja, these things are blameless, ime dhamma vinyu pasatta. These are praised by the wise, ime dhamma samatta samadhinna hitaya sukhaya sangvattan titi ata tumhe kalama upasampajya vihare yata. If this, if being engaged in good thoughts, good actions, um, bring happiness and peace to yourself and to the society, then get engaged in those actions and those views. Then the Buddha further went on to tell the Kalamas when greed or loba appears in a person, does it bring benefit or harm? The Kalamas replied, it brings harm, Bhante. Similarly, the Buddha asked when anger, dosa, or, or delusion, moha, appear in a person, is it for the benefit or harm of the person and society? They replied, that they bring harm to the society. Then the Buddha told them that when your mind is free from greed, hatred, and delusion, it will be clear and peaceful, and whatever one does with clear and peaceful mind will definitely bring happiness and peace, not just for oneself, but for others as well. But what kind of wrong views that people possess that function as bondage for their understanding of the true teaching of the Buddha. 
So there are different types of wrong views listed in the canonical text. And I'm going to present them one by one here. The first is Mitya Drishti, that is just plainly wrong view. So in Buddhist term, wrong view means when people do not understand the Four Noble Truths, they do not have belief in the functioning of karma and rebirth, they do not have an understanding of dependent origination, and apart from this, all the other forms of beliefs on earth are considered to be wrong views. You may look at the Brahma Jala Sutta, the first sutta of the Diga Nikaya, that presents a list of 62 views that are said to be avoided by one who wishes to progress in the spiritual journey. The second type of wrong view is said to be Satkaya Drishti, view of self. Grasping any one or all of the five aggregates as self. In other words, taking them as I, me, and mine. We find an expl explanation of this in the Anottalakkana Sutta, where the Buddha asked his first five ascetic friends that not to consider any of them as self, because they are of the nature of constant change, and because they produce suffering. The Buddha says, Rupang bhikkave anatta, Rupang chahidang bhikkave atta, abhavissa naidang rupang abadaya sangvatteya. Labheta cha rupe evang me rupang hotu, evang me rupang ma ahoseti. Yasma chako bhikkave rupang anatta, tasma rupang abadaya sangvattati. Nacha labhati rupe evang me rupang hotu, evang me rupang ma ahoseti. That means if form were to be self, in the same way the other aggregates, we should be able to control them. But they are not in our control. The, the translation of this exact passage is that form is not self. Well, form self, then this form would not lead to affliction. One could have it a form, let my form be thus. One could wish, one could wish that let my form be thus, let my form not be thus. And since form is not self, so it leads to affliction. And none can have it of form. Let my form be thus, let my form not be thus. For example, when we are young, we do not want to get old, for example. But as time passes, we are all going to get old. When we are alive, we do not want to die. But as time goes by, one day we all would have to die. The same goes with the other aggregates. And as the aggregates are impermanent and produce suffering, they should be regarded as not mine, not I am, not myself. The third type of wrong view or is the antagraha dhishti, the view of extreme. The most common examples of this are sasata dhishti and ucheda dhishti. This has similarity to some extent with the second one that is satkaya dhishti. But Sasata Drishti is believing in the existence of the self, for example, a permanent, unchanging, and everlasting self that continues to be reborn until the attainment of enlightenment. In other words, it is the belief in the idea that body and soul are separate entity. Anyang Jeevan, Anyang Sariram. But the Buddha said there is no self that is permanent or everlasting. Uchada Drishti or nihilism, or nihilistic idea, on the other hand, includes materialistic viewpoint. 
for them the body and the soul are one and the same thing so jivan so sarira therefore they do not believe in the next life hence appreciates a life of sensual indulgence the fourth type of wrong view is ditti paramasa that is adherence to particular views for example we may know many things we hear many beliefs but we stick to only one belief and we say that this belief is the only right one other beliefs are not and by following this particular idea one only can we attain enlightenment and so on this sort of belief is called drishti paramasha the fifth one is sila brata paramasha it means adherence to sila and brata for example as a traditional buddhist we always think that whenever we go to temple we have to take five precepts whenever we have time we have to do chanting especially in the morning and evening or even before uh, going to bed at night this is a good practice but if we take this practice as an end not as a means then we have a problematic wrong view this practicing sila or worshiping the buddha becomes a bondage for us because there are people who follow these types of practices go to temples take precepts talk to the monks but then as soon as they leave the temple they are engaged in their own activities they follow all sorts of wrong actions and they come to a conclusion that it's okay tomorrow i am going to temple and you know letting the buddha know what i am doing so buddha would forgive me you know <laughs> in the pali literature we find different stories i'd like to mention one particular story here there was a monk who was very serious in his preservation of sila he was very serious in his practice once he was traveling to a certain place on the way he faced heavy rain and due to that there was a huge flood he needed to cross a river but he fall into the strong stream of the river so to to save himself he took hold of a tiny grass but it was uprooted and he thought he broke a precept so he regretted that he broke a precept and then with that regret he dies and takes birth as a snake in the naga world see so we should be careful about practicing sila and brata we need to keep in mind that preserving sila is good as long as it functions as a means in the complete practice of the path leading to samadhi then to wisdom and then to liberation but if one holds it as an end in itself and be too much attached to it then it becomes a hindrance for him if you are free from the eight disabilities mentioned above then you have what is termed as the precious inner life the question then is should you protect it when we have it what does protecting precious inner life mean the buddha explained that this is not our first life we have died and we have been reborn countless times speech and mind all the actions become karmic force samskara these karmic forces are with us at all times so we have the potential to be good and we also have the potential to be bad usually deeds are done in accordance with the conditions that prevail at that time we do not think of what is good and what is bad what should be done and what should not be done actions performed without mindfulness 
are those generally governed by great hatred and delusion. Without right mindfulness and not looking deep into the causes and conditions of our actions, good and bad karmic forces are accumulated and the bad ones may become obstacles. We know that we all will die one day. What we do not know is the time of death. The time is uncertain. That is why it says that Jivitang Aniyatam, Marana Niyatam. So now the question is, what is more important? Is it living for many years that is important? Or living even a single moment with proper mindfulness that is important? As I said before, whatever action we perform has a resultant effect. If someone talks bad about me, it is very natural for me to get angry. But from the perspective of the Buddha's teaching, this is wrong. Because if he or she does not talk bad about you, you then have no chance to practice patience or compassion. So, that particular person creates the condition for you to practice patience and compassion. But of course, it takes time to come to that state of not getting angry. It means in getting angry, we miss the chance of practicing the Buddha Dhamma. There is an excellent example of this we find in the Jataka literature. Once Buddha Sakyamuni was born as a prince in a royal family. Everybody was very happy to have a prince in their country, but the king was not so happy because everyone was so happy and so busy that they had almost forgotten the king. So once the king passed by the queen, the queen did not show respect to the king because she was breastfeeding her son, the Bodhisattva. The king became very angry and ordered his executioner to execute the prince. During the execution, his mother, the queen, being extremely emotional, fainted right there. The little prince thought how dearly his mother loved him. He felt sympathetic to his mother, but he felt most sorry for his father, for his ignorance and and appreciated his father for giving him the opportunity to practice patience and compassion. To return this opportunity given, the prince vowed that one day he would preach the truth to the father so that he could attain enlightenment. He was so compassionate to his father. We common people usually do not have that insight of practicing this in such a way. We see things superficially and do not go deep into the causes and conditions. I should mention here that rather than taking the, this Jataka story literally, we need to look at the message that it is conveying. What is often stressed in Buddhist literature is not so much as living for 100 years, but living each and every moment with mindfulness and awareness, understanding the true purpose of life. Regarding the importance of leading a beautiful and virtuous life, we find some fantastic expressions in the Dhammapada, a very famous canonical text. For example, in the Dhammapada, we find that Yocha Vasasatan Jive Dusilo Vasamahito Ekahan Jivitan Seyo Silavantasa Jayin. Better it is to live one day virtuous and meditative than to live a hundred years immoral and uncontrolled. Better it is to live one day wise and meditative than to live a hundred years foolish and uncontrolled. So among the four precious things that were spoken by the Buddha to Nagaraja, the third one, the third most precious thing was that the Buddha explained to the dragon world the king of dragon world nagaraja that to gain the opportunity of hearing the sublime truth is not easy you may become a human being 
but not necessarily your human life is precious. Because if you do not practice the Dhamma, then you cannot claim your life to be a precious one. There are many people who are behaving worse than animal, animals sometimes. So not every life of a human being is a precious one. Not all human beings can get the Dhamma. Of course, there are many reasons. For example, if you are born in a place or country where there is no Dhamma, no monk to preach the Dhamma, no religion, religious books to read, or if you are born in a time when there is no Buddha, no Buddha Sasana, then there is no hope for you to get the Dhamma. And if there is the Buddha, there is the Sangha, and there are books explaining the Dhamma, but if your karma is not ripened, even if you listen to the Dhamma, you may not gain the Dhamma Rasa, the test of Dhamma. During the time of the Buddha, the, the chief attendant of the Buddha, Ananda, Venerable Ananda asked the Buddha, being an all-knowing one, Sabbanyu, could the Buddha save all sentient beings from this so-called samsara? The Buddha replied, no, it is not possible because their karma, if their karma is not ripened, I cannot do anything. Then he gave an example. He went to went on to a village nearby and he was preaching the Dhamma to a lady. He went in front of that lady and she moved away. And again, the Buddha went in front of that lady. Again, she moved away. The Buddha pointed out this to Venerable Ananda. He said, I'm trying to explain the Dhamma to this lady, but she's not listening to me. She's not in a position to understand me because her karmic forces did not ripe yet. But still, there was no harm listening to the Dhamma. Although she did not understand it, this seeing the Buddha and listening to the Dhamma becomes good seat for her in her thought process. So one day in a lifetime, she will surely remember the name of the Buddha. She will understand and practice the Dhamma. This happens because of the lack of awareness of what is good and what is bad. Usually, we define good and bad as what is good for me, what is good for my organization, for my society, for my family, for my country, that is good only. And what is bad is something that is not good for me, or I think that will not bring me any good, any benefit. So that is something that is bad. But as the Buddha explained, an action is good and beneficial for, for oneself and others should be considered as good. And the opposite is bad. We can recall the Rahulu Vada Sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya where the Buddha meets Rahula, his son. And upon meeting, the Buddha asked Rahula with a very beautiful simile. Buddha asked his son Rahula, what do you think Rahula is the purpose of a mirror? What does a mirror do? Rahula said, a mirror is for reflection, Venerable Sir. Then the Buddha told him in the Rahula Vada Sutta, Eva Meva Ko Rahula, Pachavekitwa Pachavekitwa, Kayena Kamankatabba, Pachavekitwa Pachavekitwa Vachaya Kamankatabba, Pachavekitwa Pachavekitwa Manasa Kamankatabba. With repeated reflection, one should perform bodily action, one should perform mental action, and one should perform verbal action. Now, when does when does one uh, has to practice this reflection, repeated reflection. Buddha said, Rahula, before you perform any action through your body, speech, and mind, think whether the action is beneficial for yourself and others. If it is not, then do not do it. Similarly, during the time of performing an action through body, speech, and mind, if the action is not beneficial, you do not do it. And even after performing the action through body, speech, and mind, you have to think if it is beneficial or harmful. If it is harmful, do not do it. If it is beneficial, then continue to do it. This is the definition of good and bad that we find in Buddhist literature. The other important reason why people do not recognize the Buddha or understand the Dhamma is that they have not heard the name of the Buddha even once in their previous lifetimes. 
during the time of the Buddha, his own cousin Devadatta, for example, was the most notorious enemy of the Buddha. Although the Buddha had ordained him, he tried to kill the Buddha many times. He did not understand the Buddha and his teachings. And there is one more example of this case. Immediately after the attainment of Bodhi or enlightenment, the Buddha went under a tree sitting cross-legged in meditation. A very famous, wise and respected Brahmin of the time known as Ganaka saw the Buddha as a calm and serenely beautiful sage. He approached the Buddha and asked, who are you? The Buddha replied, I am known as the Buddha. Not understanding what it means, the Brahmin just knocked his head and went away. So he was not able to listen to the teaching of the Buddha. He missed the opportunity. So if you do not hear the name of the Buddha even once in your previous life, you cannot recognize the Buddha, although you may see him. In this context, I'd like to say how fortunate we are we at least know who the Buddha is, although we may not probably call ourselves as good Buddhist yet, because a true follower of the Buddha is said to be one who is a Sota Panna, a Sakadagami, an Anagami, an Arahan, or even one who is trying to be a Sota Panna or Sakadagami and so on. I hope that we, we belong to at least the later category. We have to make an effort to try to be one, one of the Aryas. The fourth most important thing that the Buddha explained to Era Kapatta, that is the last one, is that hard to encounter is the arising of the Buddha. You are born as a human being and you are still alive. You are listening and practicing the Dhamma. You know who the Buddha is. After knowing all this, it is very difficult to arouse the Bodhi the enlightenment in you. Here, the arising of the Buddha, the Buddha does not only mean the Shakyamuni Buddha, the Gautama Buddha who lived 2,500 years ago in India. This is the enlightenment or the Bodhi within you. If we look at the life story of the Buddha, we see that the Buddha had to go through six years of rigorous self-mortification to find the Bodhi. And we also know that he was perfecting the 10 perfections parameters for many kalpas, many eons, in many lifetimes. But still, he had to go through these six years of self-mortification. It took a long time for him to understand what the middle path is that liberates beings from this so-called samsara. He pr practiced under two great masters, who were considered enlightened sages at that time. After the Buddha had learned from them, he realized that there is still some kind of Satkaya Drishti in them. So he left them. And as soon as he attained enlightenment, he thought of those two masters because he saw the possibilities of Buddha in them, pos possibilities of being enlightened in them but they had already passed away. Once a great master, a great Buddhist master, mentioned in one, in one of his books that we do not know what is the difference between the Buddha mind and our mind. We usually think we are practitioners of Buddha Dhamma. We can become the Buddha or achieve enlightenment. That of course is good and positive thinking, but we do not actually realize how far is the distance between the Buddha's pure mind and our mind. If we know the gap, then we can easily fill up the gap. But this pure mind of the Buddha cannot be compared with anything. It cannot be explained by any language or expression. How pure is the Buddha's mind? This Buddha, as we can see in the Buddha Vandana, is Vijja Charana Sampano, endowed with perfect and supreme knowledge and conduct. We sometimes just memorize the Buddhist verses or suttas. We study the philosophy such as the law of karma, paticca, samupada, and so on. 
if we do not put them into practice, then we will not be able to arouse the Bodhi in us. We have to emulate in uh, emulate the life and practice of the Buddha. There are many masters who followed the Buddha's teachings and practices and succeeded in life. There was a famous monk in, in Bangladesh called Banavante, who passed away several years ago. He was respected like an arahant. He would always say to the people that, my master is the Buddha. I followed the Buddha, his life, his teaching. He was my only guide, no other teaching. So until and unless we, we can take the Buddha as our supreme guide, we cannot really progress in the path. As you can see in the Buddha Vandana, the Buddha is not only a wise personality, but he is perfected in practice. Therefore, if we want to arouse the great enlightenment chitta in us, we also have to firstly acquire the knowledge and put them into practice. This is the main implication here that we have to understand. In many places in the Tipitaka, the Buddha has mentioned, I practiced this, I became the Buddha. All the past Buddhas have practiced the same path. They attained the great enlightenment. So anyone can become the Buddha if he or she practices it. So this human life is precious because one can be Buddha only in this human form. We do not find Buddhas in heavens or in other realms. This great enlightenment lies within every one of us and we should strive to realize it. But how do we attain enlightenment? Buddha said very plainly, all evil deeds should be abandoned. Good actions should be performed. Mind has to be purified. This is the teaching of all the Buddhas. All the Buddhas of the past have followed this simple rule and became enlightened. If we follow this, we also will certainly become Buddhas. So after knowing all this, we should be aware of what should be done and what should not be done. Thus, we should be able to proceed on to practice the Dhamma. We will learn to appreciate this precious human life of ours. We will value each and every moment of the life because any time, any moment, we can lose it. Then we may not have the chance to get it back again. So finally, I wish that we all truly understand how precious our lives are. And I hope we will act accordingly in our lives. Wishing everyone happiness and peace. I wish to end my discussion here. Thank you once again to Madam Dr. Yojana Bhagat and Bhante Bodhimitra and everyone who participated in the talk. Sabde Satta Sukita Mantra. Havatu sabha mangalang rakkantu sabha devata sabha buddhanu bhavena sada sutte bhavantu te Havatu sabha mangalang rakkantu sabha devata sabha dhammanu bhavena sada sutte bhavantu te Havatu sabha mangalang rakkantu sabha devata sabha sanghanu bhavena sada sutte bhavantu te Aka satta chabhumatta deva naga mahindika Unyantang anumoditwa chirang rakkantu sasana Aka satta chabhumatta deva naga mahindika Unyantang anumoditwa chirang rakkantu desana Aka satta chabhumatta deva naga mahindika Punyantang anamoditwa chirang rakkantu mangparam Idang me yatinang hoto sukita huntu yatayo Idang me yatinang hoto sukita huntu yatayo Idang me yatinang hoto sukita huntu yatayo Kaye navacha chitte na pamade namaya katam Achayang kamame bante bhuri panyata thagata Kaye na vacha chitte na pamade na maya katam 
अच्छयं खममे धम्मा संदिट्टिका अकालिका काये नवाचा चित्ते न पमादे न माया कतं अच्छयं खममे संगा पुण्यक्षेत्ता अनुत्थरा अभिवादना सीलेशा निचं वद्धा पचायिनो चत्तारो धम्मा वर्धन्ते आयुवन्नो सुखं वलं आयुरा रोग्ग संपत्ति सग्ग संपत्ति मेवचा अतो निबान संपत्ति इमिनाते समिज्जतो